Welcome. So I am here today with my new friend, Lynn Watson. We met on Instagram. We found out that we both sew. So I'm going to just um, let Lynn take a moment to introduce herself. That we both sew. Okay, that's a good lead in, right? <laughs> it is a good lead in, lead right? Because I, I do sew and I did learn those that skill mostly from my grandmother and my mother. And um, we're I'm launching a book. It's a debut novel. And my grandmother certainly is a part of that inspiration. It was her mother that actually is the kind of the person that would be behind the um, the heroine in the story. Um, and I'm sure my grandmother learned to sew from her mother. I'm sure that was true. Um, but I have followed in her footsteps for many years. I sewed everything um, from so little smock, kids smock dresses and infant wear, bridal wear, you know, the whole nine yards. My husband and I even designed and published kind of cross stitch leaflets for a number of years back when that was a really popular thing to do. So um, that's one of my, one of the things I love today. I only get to do a little bit of um, quilting with yeah. it. So I'm also a reflexologist, which means that I can relax people through their feet quite well. And most of them enjoy that a lot. And that takes a good bit of my time, but uh, between that and the fact that the great grandmother I mentioned was the daughter. So I'm the great, great granddaughter of a baron in Southwest Germany. Um, snippets, tiny snippets, because that's about all I know of her story inspired the book. Um, and I put all that together to say my heritage and my passions have me stepping through time, stitching stories of faith. That's wonderful. I love it. Um, so I'm curious when did you first start? Like, what are your first memories of sewing? My first, okay. I guess the first memories I have of sewing were the printed quilt blocks, kitty quilt blocks. I don't know if that was still around. You're, you're a little younger than I am. <laughs> Those may or may not been around still at that point, but my mother would buy these little quilt blocks. They were about that big. And we put them in a hoop and I'd have embroidery thread and we would, she and my grandmother taught me the different stitches and taught me to embroider those little quilt squares. So that was my very first experience with it, um, memory. Um, when I was about 12, I was making Barbie doll clothes like crazy. And my grandmother asked me to make some for some um, of her niece's girls who she wanted to give them to for Christmas. And so that was my first paying, little paying gig with sewing. And then, um, did you continue to sew like clothing, your own clothing through maybe your adolescent years up through high school? I did quite a bit of it for a long time, even up into adulthood. And, you know, and sewed for the, like I said, I sewed for the public for many years, kept me, kept me home with my children, which is what I wanted. And I think I mentioned it in one of the Facebook or Instagram things you posted. And I said, yeah, I've sat sewing with a baby in my lap, you know, <laughs> And she was only four years old when we moved from that house. But she told me recently she remembered this little cabinet thing that her daddy had built in the kitchen. And you could let the, you could push this table kind of part of it up and close it up and you could let it down. And she, she said she just had little, little snitches of memories about it, but she had some. And I was like surprised because she was four years old when we moved from there. But That's great. When you did sew from your home, did you have um, an actual like business name? Did you advertise or you just used a word of mouth? Word of mouth. Word of mouth is great. Word of mouth is the best. It's the best, yes. And you can get inundated so quickly. Yes. Which, yeah. My reflexology business has a name and I have a Facebook page for it, but I try very hard not to advertise too much because I need to spend my time writing and you know, and a few other little hobbies here and there, right? <laughs> yes, agreed. Because um, as a writer myself, I know I'm always trying to keep the sewing business going smoothly enough, but not feeling overloaded because I have to carve out time to write. So I can very much understand that. Exactly. When you sewed for others, did you was it all like custom made from scratch or were you doing alterations as well? Most of it was made from scratch. I'm, alterations are kind of not my thing. 
when I would go in to buy something ready made and some and the store person would say, well, you could just take this in here or this here. I'd look at them and go, no, I'll start from scratch if I have to do that, you know? <laughs> so that was never really a big thing. I did would hem stuff for people and things like that. And I did do some alterations, but it was not my cup of tea. I would read, just give me the fabric, give me the patterns. I can make this fit you perfectly if you just let me do it, you know, from square one. <laughs> That's great. I actually assumed that when I started my business that I would make a lot more from scratch. And it's interesting how our different personalities, maybe it's even a sign of the the time in which we live and the availability of good fabric. But I found that making clothes from scratch for people was something I absolutely hated. So that's how I fell into alterations, even though I'd never altered a single thing. I, and I was in an alterations business. Like before I opened the business, I never altered anything ever. But if you knew how to sell, I mean, you could do it. I could do it. That wasn't the, yeah. the issue. Yes. Not something I enjoyed doing. You just yeah. didn't like it. And I, sh I shouldn't say that. I do have a memory of buying like a ready-made kind of bodysuit when I was a teenager and altering it because I didn't like the way that it fit. But for the most part, I was very much a make from scratch growing up and then fell into alterations later on. Um, So in, in your book, I was privileged to be on the launch team, which is really fun. I know that you mentioned some um, sewing circles that the ladies have. And of course the setting is in Germany. Remind me of the year it was in the later 18... Okay. This book, the second book will be in 1882. And then okay. the book is going to be, is planned to be dual timeline. So it'll be back in the late 19th century, but also present day. So that'll be... Oh, that's an interesting... Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting feat for sure. Um, but I, hope I can pull I... it off as well as I... As it's, it's, <laughs> Seems it's circling up here in my head, you know. I hope I pull it off as well on the screen, on the typewriter, on the keyboard. Yes. Um, and so as we were talking about the sewing circles back in that time period, I'd love to hear you just expound on that a little bit, as far as like historically what, um, how those worked and maybe what their purpose was. The ladies would get together as much for social outlet as anything, but it was also productive. And the community where they were, the protagonist, the, you know, the heroine of the story, she is um, a fam part of a no noble family. Her father is the Baron, which really relates mayoral kind of thing. Not necessarily high nobility. It's not a high ranking thing. It's not royalty. It's nothing like that. But they were still bound by the rules. But they were very, because it was a rural area. They were, um, they were all friends. You know, everybody was friends, and um, these were th things they could do together. She led these women in a Bible study in the book, and I think that a lot of times that was the kind of thing that happened. You know, I think back at my my grandmother's. You know, back in the early, in the mid mid to early, you know, part of the century, the last century how they would talk about their sewing circles and that sort of thing. And I know that that was important to them, you know, for they get a lot, a lot of production done. And for these women in this little community, you know, money was, they needed money to keep food on the table and, a roof, you know, and a roof over their head. And where Clara, the main character's father, was responsible to be sure that the people in his group were cared, were cared for, it, there were all pieces to it. And so when they started that business, it was, they didn't actually start it as a business. They did it together, but then decided, you know, Meg's is going, hey, can I order some from you, you know, for sh my shop? And so that's what happened. They started doing them as a business. Yeah, that's great. It reminds me, even as we were chatting about our own sewing businesses, giving us the opportunity to stay home with our kids, it's almost a similar theme back in that day, meaning they could earn some money from them as they sent them off to be used in higher fashion. And then they could, you know, help provide for their families, which was really practical and useful. And um, 
the other thing that you mentioned was a little bit about the fashion of the day and the trip to the Paris fashion houses, which if you have any more you'd love to share on that, I, I'd love to hear it. Um, I sent you some pictures and some things like that yesterday. So I know you've, you've probably seen a little bit of it. I was, first of all, I told Naomi, I researched this book like two and three years ago as I was, you know, going along writing and I've done a lot of stuff. So a lot of my research was not fresh in my mind and I've had to go back and dig a little. But one of the things that amazed me about the house of worth, which, you know, obviously all these expensive clothes that Mrs. Palmer of Palmer House fame in Chicago. I mean, she bought all of her clothes from him, from him. And uh, a lot of other women did too, actors and, you know, actresses, different people. They, uh, they just, they followed him and they bought from him. But when I saw some pictures of the interiors of the House of Worth, I was blown away by the wide open spaces, the marble and interiors with the big palms and the overstuffed furniture where the clients could come in and have a, you know, be served and where the women that were working, that were doing the sewing for him, we had these wide, these places with these wide open windows and things like that around them. So it's all that natural light. And I thought, oh, how amazing, because I have sewn in a closet before. So, you know, <laughs> that was like, wow. I mean, one yeah. of the things. And then the other thing that I think you and I talked about, um, sorry, I'm just um, trying to pull my thoughts together here. The other thing you and I talked about a little bit was the, was the actual styles. And mm. late 1880s, there was, you know, trends, that were starting more women were wanting to do their own thing you know more women were trying to branch out they wanted to they wanted to go into medicine they wanted to go into you know teaching which wasn't even something a woman did necessarily except maybe a kindergarten you know or something like that teacher which was big in germany germany's always had you know schooling k through 12 for their children for years and years and years um went way back to that time but they wanted to be a doctor, they wanted to be a nurse, or they, you know, they just, they wanted to reach out, they wanted to do the things that women today, you know, have wanted to do, and there was a push in America toward the um, women's vote, the suffrage movement, that sort of thing, so a lot of the styles I have read in some, ref, you know, some books and some websites had gone to a more man, menswear, more manly looking, more tailored, um, not as many frills, not as many beads, not as many ruffles and that sort of thing. But then I was telling Naomi, as you go into the house of worth and you look at what he had and you start looking through all these pictures of dresses that came out of his, his fashion house, they were very elaborate. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's hard to say. It was also a time period when things were moving from the very shapely thing, you know, the bus, the big bustle was gone, but the there were still the little, the corsets and the, the hoop skirts were gone. The bustle was still a little bit there. And, um, and it was starting to go toward what they called a more aesthetic look, which was more slim lines, straight mm -hmm. lines. It's not, not as fitted necessarily some princess lines, things like that. So those were the changes that were happening during that time period. Yeah. Yeah. It's, almost a different world, right? From the world we live in of casual wear all the time. And to think of corsets, we were um, reminiscing about that a little bit before we hopped on here as well. And I had the one student who was just a, um, a young girl who wanted to sew her own corset. And of course we did and we made it work, but it's not something that we typically wear with any of our clothing these days. Maybe more of um, a costume piece. <laughs> But um, the way that fashion has changed for sure is really interesting and fascinating. So I, I definitely enjoyed that part of the book. And so remind our listeners, your book launches the 21st, right? Of this month of May? From Tuesday. Yeah, exciting. Amazon and I think you've probably got the links that yes, you can see. I do, I do. So I'm going to put them all in the show notes and it's available for pre-order as well. And before we wrap up, um, I was curious if you had any favorite sewing tool that you've developed over the years. 
Well, I was trying to describe the sewing tool to, to you because I don't know what it's called. But it's a very long, almost looks like a knitting needle. It's very long and very skinny. It's got a little, kind of a loop on one end like that. And on the other end, it has a little piece that can pinch fabric in it, just a little tiny piece. And so you want to make just like a tube of fabric. And I I did this. I sewed a ton of this up to put all over a wedding dress. The girl, had, we ordered some, um, I don't want to say, it was silk. It was hand dyed silk, mo modeled mo multicolors. Um, we bought a whole lot of that and I made lots and lots of these little tubes and we kind of I sewed them into circles into like flowers and we put them around the edges it was a very renaissance looking dress and all on the white gown all this trim and so I was able to sew these long tubes of fabric little tiny and then th thread this tool through it and grab the end and then pull it back out and turn it and I'd have these perfect little lengths of things that I could just keep going yeah, to tube turn anything without a tool like that, it's like impossible for sure. You can't do it. And so this was just amazing. That's great. That's a new one. And I'm pretty sure that I don't have one of those tools. If I do, it's buried somewhere because I probably got it handed down from somebody that was older and cleaning out their attic because I do get a lot of people that say oh I can't sew anymore and I'm getting rid of all this stuff or it's a mother or grandmother that passed away and nobody else sews and so they come knocking on my door asking if I want it before they throw it out <laughs> you may find some really interesting things doing that yeah. sure you yes do. I have I have so I, I do wonder if I might have one of those things in a back cubby somewhere that I have not really put to good I'll use. I'll see if I can find the name of it because I might still have the little card, you know, that it came on. Yeah, the package. I'm yeah. Positive. But if I do, I'll find the name. Yes. I was going to yeah. say, we might want to let people know what the book is about besides sewing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and so if you <clears throat> want to fill us in a little, I know that, um, you probably give a better description than I would, but it, oh, it's a pretty good job. You've read it. Oh, uh, go I was asked you three words to describe it, and the three. And I said, I asked somebody else that's on the launch team who's read it. I said, "What three words would you give?" And she said, "What did she tell me?" She said, "Enchanting." Um, enchanting was one. Triumphant was one, and sincere, I think, was one of them. And I went. Hmm. Okay, those are interesting words, but um, the bottom yeah. line is that um, yeah, I, I think would... that the, the back cover is the best. You know, the best thing for it is yeah. just yeah. I would say it um almost reminded me a little bit of um a Downton Abbey feel. A lot of people have said that. H is it? But yeah, it's a not. good a chunk of decades before. I mean, it was probably almost. A lot of decades before Downton Abbey, for sure, and not even in the same country, so in Germany. And um, I've always really liked historical fiction, so I enjoyed that part of the book, just having the history and the culture and that kind of thing. And I think maybe one of the first books that I've read with historical fiction in Germany in that time period. And so I did really enjoy that as well. I'm going to say, I think and, that I can uh, probably read this if you want me to, but go ahead and finish what you were going to say. Oh, yeah. And then that classic um, love story of, you know, not being able to cross over the societal norms the forbidden which <laughs> was for sure something that you see a lot of back then more so than we hear about now though i yeah the forbidden love trope was a big thing back you know in that time period mm -hmm. definitely we don't hear about it as much you're right um but there was so many other pieces to it of why the father actually did what he did mm -hmm. He was a loving father. That's the point I, I'm hoping that came across to people is he was a loving father, but he was so torn. 
between his family and his responsibilities and all the pieces that went with it. But um, thunderous applause extinguishes her dream and ignites Clara Reinhold's worst nightmare. Her father publicly pledged her hand to Georg Wolf. His character and arrogance match the stench of his odious cigars, but his lineage offers a suitable alliance for the station of a baron's daughter. A charade's clue years earlier turned friendship into a promise of forbidden marriage between Clara and family carriage driver Daniel Becker. If she refuses Georg and follows her heart, her father disowns her and she loses everything, her loving family, dear friends, and the only home she's known. As a tangled web of scandal and deceit unwinds, hidden motives and illicit activities emerge among an unsuspecting ring of players, changing everything but nobility's rules. How will justice be served? How will Clara and Daniel overcome obstacles to claim a future beyond that of a charade? And I've even called Georg the villain you'll love to hate because people have told me that they love to hate him <laughs> as people have started to read it. So I think that that was that. That's great. Yeah. I would say um, reading it, I think I have, I don't know if I have a strongish personality but I don't think that I would have been able to be the obedient daughter to accept that. Well, that not been a tough thing to do to have to be obedient. Yep. And she was torn, you know, and we go into the second book. She's still torn. Things are, you know, things are still, yeah, there's still challenges. I don't want to say too much. But... Oh, I'm sure there are because the decision has decisions are made and then you have to live with them have to live with your decisions and yeah the outcome of them and yeah right yeah, for sure all right well i will wrap it up with that and thank you so much for joining us here today i will leave all of those links in the show notes so you can be sure to go and check out lynn's new book and um as always for authors it's really great once you read it leave reviews, comments, stay connected and look for her next book when that comes yes, out as thank well. Thank you. Thank you. Which will be a year from now, which is a long way to wait, but that's how that works. And so I'm frantically trying to get it finished, but it'll be there. <laughs> yes, it will. You'll get there. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Yes. Thank you for joining us. I just wanted to add here at the end, this is a picture of that tool that Lynn was talking about a couple of pictures that you can use to make like cording and an image from her new book that's coming out. Be sure to check that out in the show notes.